Hello, uh, this is John Nogueira from Sigma Excel. I am the Chief Technology Officer. Today's webinar uh, called What's New in Sigma Excel Version 8? This is the second of a three-part series and today we'll be looking at multiple comparisons also known as post hoc testing, chi-square tests, and measures of table association. So this is our agenda. We'll start with the one-way ANOVA, and the new post hoc tests include Fisher, Tukey, and Dunnett. And then we will look at comparing variances, and then we'll, uh, we'll look at the post hoc tests for variances uh, in both in Bartlett and Levine. Then we will look at comparing means in Welch ANOVA when you cannot assume equal variance, and the comparison test is called games Howell. We will also be looking at chi-square tests and table associations. All right, so let's start with the one-way ANOVA. So in the one-way ANOVA, uh, one of the things that we try to do as we uh, progress from version 7 to version 8 is to keep the dialogues uncluttered and especially for trainers to access the new features, you, they are accessible via the options button. So that way, whether or not to introduce the, the new tools and new features uh, is optional. So it just makes it easier from a training perspective. We will look at, as I mentioned, the Fisher, Tukey, and Dunnett. We've also added the confidence level to One Way Nova. Previously, it was fixed at 95%. Residual plots, previously they were only in two-way ANOVA, and now they've been added to the one-way ANOVA and Welch ANOVA. And then also, uh, as we discussed in the first webinar, the ability to display the analysis of means, normal one-way chart, uh, is provided as an option. So let's begin with Fisher. Now, in version 7, the uh, pairwise means matrix that we provided with the p-values was, in fact, the Fisher p-values. Essentially, these are pairwise two-sample t-tests with a pooled standard deviation. However, they do not correct for family-wise error rate. So what that means is that if you have, let's say you had five comparisons, then you would have 10 pairwise tests. Or if you have six levels, that would give you uh, 15 comparisons. And if you have seven levels or categories, that would give you seven times six over two pairwise comparisons. And you start to get into a large number of pairwise comparisons. And each test has a 5% alpha risk. So with seven uh, category levels, you would end up almost certainly triggering a false alarm on the type 1. You'd have 21 pair, pairwise comparisons, so you would very likely see false alarms in your pairwise comparisons uh, using just the Fisher test. So what we recommend for Fisher is that you only use it if you have three means or three groups, three levels, and only when the p-value of the ANOVA is less than alpha or less than 0.05. Tukey, on the other hand, corrects for the family-wise error rate. So if you have more than three levels, you're doing, uh, you have more than three categories, then you should use Tukey, and it uses the studentized range statistic. I'm not going to get into the details, but that corrects for uh, the family-wise error rate so that the overall error rate is 5%, or whatever the alpha that you set. Dunnett is the third choice that we've added. And if you have a control group, for example, uh, you, or you have a gold standard, a reference standard, a known reference standard, and you want to compare against the reference standard in your ANOVA, then you would use the Dunnett with control, and that would reduce the number of comparisons. So you're not doing all pairwise, you're comparing against the control. And that, that becomes more powerful than Tukey because you're simply doing fewer comparisons. All right, so we will look at all of these. Also, we have confidence level. And so when we talk about alpha in the anom chart or highlighting p-values in red, 
those the thresholds will be determined from the confidence level. So if I specify a 95% confidence level, that will set the alpha to 0 0.05. We've added residual plots, similar to what we had in the two-way ANOVA. So you have histogram, normal probability plot, uh, residuals versus data order, residuals versus uh, predicted or fitted, and residuals versus X values. Finally, as we mentioned, you have the option to display the anom normal one-way chart. I'm going to switch over now to Excel, and we'll, we'll have a look now at one-way ANOVA with the new options. This is the customer data that we use throughout the workbook. So statistical tools, one-way ANOVA, and I'll use the entire data table. And uh, notice that it comes up. It's basically the dialog looks the same as in version 7, except now you have this options button. So when you click the options button, that brings up the new features in version 8. So the example we're going to do is overall satisfaction by customer type. And we have the choices of Fisher, Tukey, and Dunnett. We'll start with Fisher. And we'll, I'll turn on the display residual plots. And we'll display the anom normal one-way chart. All right, so with that, I'll just go ahead and we'll run that. And this is the the same output as, as was uh, in version 7. The ANOVA p-value tells us that we can reject the null hypothesis. The null hypothesis is that the means are equal. The alternative hypothesis is that at least one pairwise comparison of means are not equal. So if you, with this low p-value, we're saying that the means are not the same. And previously, we had this pairwise mean difference. So what we have are the red highlight comes from the p-values. So if the p-value is less than alpha, we're highlighting. So this is saying that mean 1 minus mean 2, this minus 0.8 is significant. And mean 2 minus mean 3, this 0.56 is significant. To re recap, we're looking at satisfaction scores. And we can look at this graphically so we can see the SAT score for customer type 1 is here at uh, 3.4. And then we have the, um, the SAT score for customer type 2, 4.2, and the SAT score for customer type 3 at uh, 3.6. 1 versus 2, you can see from the graph, actually, that there is no overlap of the uh, confidence interval. So that also tells you that they're different. And then uh, 2 versus 3, we see that 2 versus 3 is also different. There's a little bit of overlap here. And that's why you also you need this uh, p-value to, to help you in interpretation. So 2 and 3 are different. However, 1 versus 3, the satisfaction score, mean sat score for 1 versus 3, we say that there is no significant difference. OK, so this is all, uh, this information was all in version 7, Fisher pairwise probabilities. However, now, if I recall Sigma Excel dialog, and I I change this to two key, I'm, I'm going to uncheck the residual and the anom normal because I don't need that anymore. Or I'll, I'll look at the ones that have already been created. Now I show the two key probabilities. So uh, notice that the two key probability here is 0 0.0044, whereas here it's 0 0.0016. So in order to adjust for the family-wise error rate, Tukey does increase the, the p-value. So, so you are losing some power. However, you don't run into the problem of false alarms when you have lots of pairwise comparisons. Like I said, if we had seven groups, we would have 21 pairwise comparisons. And the likelihood of a false alarm is very high. So Tukey adjusts the family-wise error rate so that the overall error rate in the means matrix is uh, 0.05 or the overall type 1 rate is 0.05. And, and then also the Dunnett test, if I recall, and I select Dunnett, 
And supposing customer type 2 was my control, then the Dunnett test only compares against customer type 2. So you'll notice this p-value is blank. Now we still display the mean difference, but the p-value is blank. And that's because we, only, we are only considering 1 versus 2 and 2 versus 3. 2 is the control group. Now traditionally, in a Dunnett test, you actually uh, subtract. You always say 1 minus 2 or 3 minus 2, but what we, what we did was we kept the matrix so that the format was the same, upper right triangle. We didn't want to change the look and feel. So just keep that in mind that in this case it's 1 minus 2, in this case it's 2 minus 3, but that doesn't affect the p-values. That just affects the sign up here on the, uh, the mean difference. So to recap, if you have three levels, as we do in this case, or three groups, then we recommend Fisher pairwise probabilities. If you have more than three, we recommend Tukey, because Tukey adjusts for the family-wise error rate. If you have a control or a standard, a reference standard, uh, that you want to compare against, then use Dunnett, and the drop-down allows you to select uh, which, one, which group is the control group. Okay, so that's the post-hoc tests for one-way ANOVA. Also, we have the residuals. So that's basically just looking at the unexplained variation. And here, you're looking for no pattern, approximately normally distributed, and that's what we have. Uh, same as what we had in the two-way ANOVA, but now we have it in the one-way ANOVA. That was uh, something that was commonly requested and allows you to uh, more quickly assess your one-way ANOVA, uh, adequacy of uh, the one-way ANOVA. And the anom normal one-way we talked about in the first webinar where we have the comparisons against the grand mean. So here customer type 1 is significantly below the grand mean. Customer type 2 is significantly above the grand mean or average of, of the groups. And customer type 3 is not significantly different from the grand mean or overall average. All right, so that's the, uh, the one-way ANOVA. Now, to save time, I, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to switch over to the PowerPoint slide. Oh, and what I, another thing I did in this PowerPoint is I grouped, I show the Tukey and Fisher together, so it just makes it easier to compare the results. You can see the Tukey has a higher p-value, which means a slight loss of power, but that's necessary to compensate so that you don't get those type 1 errors. Okay, so now what we want to do is now look at Bartlett's test for equal variance. So in Bartlett's test, we're assuming normal data, and we, we're testing for equality of variances, and we've added the F-test pairwise and the F-test with Bonferroni correction. It's, uh, we don't have a nice Tukey test to apply here. We do uh, in the Levine's, but we don't in the Bartlett's test. So we, we did the best we could, which is simply uh, an F-test with Bonferroni correction. Bonferroni is not as powerful as Tukey, but it does adjust for the family-wise error rate. We've added the confidence level and the checkbox to display anom variances chart. So with the Bartlett's test, you have the uh, F-test pairwise, so two sample F-tests. And as I mentioned to you, there's no correction. So you should uh, limit that to only when you have three groups and only in the restricted case where the Bartlett p-value is less than alpha. Otherwise, use the F-test with the Bonferroni correction. So basically, the Bonferroni correction is it multiplies the p-value times the number of tests and number of pairwise comparisons to adjust for the family-wise error rate. Let's look at the Levine's test. I'm not going to do an example with Bartlett's. That's pretty straightforward. It's just data are normal and you're testing for equal variances. The Levine's test, we, for the multiple comparison, we have the Levine pairwise, which does not adjust for family-wise. And then something that we did that is unique 
and this was inspired by the Levine uh, analysis of means chart, and that is that that statistic, the ADM or absolute deviations from the median, and to you can apply the Tukey test to the absolute deviations from the median, even though it's a variance, a robust variance. You can you can in fact apply the Tukey to this ADM, so it makes it very nice. Uh, for the follow-up multiple comparisons. So Levine's, again, if you're using the pairwise, limit it to only when you have three groups and when the p-value is less than alpha. And then for Tukey, if you have more than three groups, then use the Tukey ADM. All right, so let's have a look at that. Here, we, we're doing equal variance tests, and here's our dialogue responsiveness to calls by customer type. Responsiveness to calls is data that we know is not normal from previous analyses, and we'll see that as well in the report. And here, as you can see, I have the choice of Levine pairwise or Tukey's absolute deviation from median. And then also the ability to display the analysis of means chart uh, for Levine robust variances. So, Here's my report. These tell you that the data are not normal. So Levine's test is appropriate. If you were to use the Bartlett's test, that would be inappropriate because the Bartlett's test assumes, assumes normality. So we are using the Levine's test. And this p-value tells you that the variances are not equal. So you reject the null hypothesis. Now here, the pairwise probabilities is telling me that the variance of one and the variance of two are different. I'm only showing the probabilities. I'm not showing the F ratios or anything like that. We just simplify on the variances. So this p-value tells us that the variance of one is different from the variance of two. And one versus three, we cannot, we say that they're the same. And two versus three, we say that the variances are the same. You also then have, which is nice graphical complement, the, um, we saw this in the first webinar, the analysis of means chart for Levine robust variances. Customer type one has a significantly higher variability. Customer type two has a significantly lower variability than the overall average. And customer type three is, is not different. So you have a nice graphical complement to the Levine's test. Now, in addition, we have the Tukey test. So if I had more than three categories, here I only have three, but I'm still just displaying it. And you can see how Tukey increases the p-value to adjust for the family-wise error rate. Okay, but if you have more than three, then you want to use the Tukey comparison because that way you're not triggering false alarms uh, in your pairwise comparisons. Now, here we conclude for responsiveness to calls that we have unequal variances. If we want to compare the means, we cannot use regular ANOVA because regular ANOVA assumes equal variances. And so for that, we have the Welch test. Welch is ANOVA. And we added to the Welch's ANOVA the, a follow-up called the Welch pairwise, which does not adjust for the family-wise error rate, and the Gaines-Howell test, which does. It's basically like a Tukey test for Welch's ANOVA. We also added the ability to adjust the confidence level, residual plots. A note, however, that there is, we do not have an ANOM chart for Welch's ANOVA. Unfortunately, it's quite complicated and re would require two-stage sampling, so, so that is not something that is included in the ANOM chart is not a part of the Welch's test. So with the Welch pairwise, it's basically like two sample t-tests for unequal variances. You just do all the pairwise. You're not using pooled standard deviation. You're using unpooled. So as per all of the other unadjusted tests, we recommend that you limit it to only the case where you have three means or three groups and when the uh, ANOVA p-value is less than alpha. So only when Welch's ANOVA 
is significant should you use the Welch pairwise comparisons. Gaines Howell applies, it's an extension of the Tukey test, but assumes unequal variance. So it is the correct post hoc test to be used uh, with Welch's ANOVA when you have more than three groups. So here, we've also added Welch's ANOVA to the main menu. Previously, it was kind of hidden under equal variance tests. So we put Welch's ANOVA under the drop down so you can see it under statistical tools. And then when you click options, you have the Welch and you have the Games Howell along with the confidence level and the residual plots. When you run your Welch's ANOVA, this is the pairwise probabilities. This tells us that there is a, a the, this is responsiveness to calls. The mean responsiveness to calls, one versus two, is significantly different. But all of the others are not. And then rerunning this using Games Howell, we get the same levels. Uh, the, we see one versus two again as significant. But notice that the p-value is higher because we're adjusting the family-wise error rate. So if you have more than three groups, you will want to use the Games Howell or your post hoc analysis for your multiple comparison of means. So again, Welch's ANOVA is used when you confirm that you have unequal variance because regular ANOVA assumes equal variance. And then with the new features now, you have the Welch pairwise and you have the Games Howell. Another thing I want to mention that I, uh, I, I just want to come back to the e test for equal variances, something that is particularly important when you compare variances, when you identify a statistically significant difference in variance, that's actually a very valuable tool in the process improvement toolkit. Because in this particular case, customer type 2, not only does customer type 2 have a higher mean responsiveness to calls, they also have less variability. And so that's, that's an important thing to, to recognize is that the rating on uh, responsiveness to calls is consistently higher. And, and you would want to look at their best practices to see what is it that they're doing differently from the others and perhaps identify opportunities for improvement that can be implemented across the board. So yes, when we're doing equal variance tests, we're checking the assumptions to determine whether or not we can use one-way ANOVA. But I also see this from a Six Sigma quality, from a process improvement point of view, as a, an opportunity to improve the process. Okay, So that takes care of the uh, ANOVA and the Welch's ANOVA and the equal variance tests. So now we want to look at the chi-square tests and table association. This is now discrete data. So we're looking at count data. So we've added the ability to analyze with either nominal categories or ordinal categories. We've added, uh, we've modified the dialog so that it makes it easier to interpret. We changed the labels so that it now says rows category, and columns category, and frequency count. So this makes it cleaner in terms of interpreting how you're going to create your table, uh, what's also known as the contingency table. And here are the, after you click the options, you have the ability to specify nominal categories and ordinal categories. Now, a caution. We have added a very comprehensive list of tests and metrics, association metrics. You probably aren't going to use all of them, but uh, it's one of these things that pr different practitioners have different favorite tests that they use when, they, when they're doing their chi-square tests. And so essentially, we provide you with a smorgasbord, and you can pick and choose which metrics you would like to use. I think it's useful to have the additional metrics because not only are we looking at tests of significance, but now we are looking at degree of association. It's one thing to say that major complaint is different or different across customer types, but the, then the next question is, well, how, to what extent are they different? To what is the degree of association? If they're not independent, then what is the degree of association? And that's what these association metrics will tell you.
Certainly during this presentation, we are not going to cover any of the statistical details. I'll give you rules of thumb. You can go to the workbook appendix and look up the references and the formulas. So you have a choice. You'll get uh, these options can come to you either from the two-way table data, if you have a two-way table format, contingency table format, or if you have stack column format. Okay. If you have a, ta a two-way table format, we ha we now have this these options. Uh, you can check if you leave them unchecked. It will look exactly as it did in version 7. As soon as you check one of these, you will get all of the new uh, metrics. As well, we've added a confidence level, uh, and that will come to play when we look at the new residuals. And those new residuals are called adjusted residuals. Previously in version 7, we just had the observed counts, the expected counts, and the standardized residuals. And you set your, to interpret the chi-square, you're essentially looking at the standard as residuals. Now with the adjusted residuals, the nice thing about the adjusted residuals is that they are normally distributed. So as a result, we can use the z-score. For example, if we specified a 95% confidence level, anything bigger than plus or minus 1.96 gets highlighted. We also uh, put in another feature. If it's bold red, that means not only is it significant, but it's significant with the Bonferrani adjustment. All right, so it's either red or bold red. But if the chi-square is not significant, if the overall chi-square p-value is not significant, then you will not see any highlighting. So it's trying to avoid type 1 errors, false alarms, because in a chi-square test, as you can see here, in a 3x3, three three, there are nine tests going on. So we want to try to avoid the problem of misfires, type 1 errors. So uh, you only get the red highlight if the overall chi-square p-value is, is significant. We also added self-contribution to chi-square. So if you want to see how it breaks out, you can look at the self-contribution to chi-square. And in this case, you can see that what the biggest contributors are here correspond to the larger adjusted residuals. Now, previously, we, in, uh, we would look at the standardized residuals. Now we're recommending that you look at the adjusted residuals. And the top, the top three adjusted residuals do match the top three standardized residuals. There is a slight discrepancy. When you get into a test, you know, number four and five here, but we're not going to worry about that. Now you're really getting into the noise. And when you're looking at uh, what are the contributors to chi-square, it's usually a Pareto principle at work. We've added other chi-square tests, likelihood ratio that some practitioners like because it's used in advanced categorical analysis. We've added a what's called a mcnamar boker test. This is useful in a two-by-two two table. It's, a pair, it's like a pair t-test, but it's a pair proportion test. So if you're looking at proportion before and after on the same subject, and that will be an exact p-value. Whereas if it's a, a bigger than a two by two, then it's, it's a symmetry test. Now on the association, if it's a two by two, then Pearson's phi is the measure that we recommend. It's the most popular measure. But even though Pearson's phi is actually the same as a correlation coefficient in a two by two table, it goes from minus one to plus one. For table associations, we recommend the rules that Cohen recommends. And those rules are as follows. If it's less than 0 0.1, we call that very weak. If it's 0 0.1 to 0 0.3 or less than 0 0.3, it's weak. If it's 0.3 to less than 0.5, we call that moderate. And if it's greater than 0.5, we consider that strong. So the interpretation for a typical table is a bit different from what you're used to seeing. When you have correlation coefficient, we usually say bigger than 0.9 is strong. Bigger than 0.7 is interesting or moderate. So we, we recommend the Cohen rules for these uh, tables of association. So what you're looking at is less than 0.3 is weak. 
greater than 0.5 is strong. Now, I said phi was uh, appropriate for a 2 by 2, but if you have bigger tables, then you want to use Kramer's V. And uh, by the way, both are the chi-squared measures of association. Kramer's V varies from 0 to 1. 0 is no association, 1 is perfect association, but again, we recommend Cohen's rules of thumb, so bigger than 0.5 is a strong association. Contingency coefficient is just another measure. We'll not go into that one. It's sometimes used by some practitioners. We've also added Cohen's kappa to a table, which if you're familiar with measurement systems analysis, we already have that in the attribute MSA. But now, if you're doing, if you're actually looking at appraisers and you're looking at degrees of association, then you can use the Cohen's kappa in the in the table analysis. Uh, this rule of thumb here, we recommend a little bit weaker than the regular guidelines in measurement systems analysis. So, uh, Fleiss recommends a kappa of bigger than 0.75 is strong agreement and less than 0.4 is weak agreement. All right, so that's the one exception to the rule of thumb. All of the others are greater than 0.5 is strong, less than 0.3 is weak. Now we get into other more advanced measures of association, lambda, tau, and uncertainty. These are known as measures of proportional reduction in predictive error. The concept is a measure that indicates how much knowing the value of the independent variable improves our ability to estimate the value of the dependent variable. Kind of like our square, again, Cohen's rules of thumb, less than 0.3 is weak, greater than 0.5 is strong. The, also, uh, these are directional measures, so there's a rows dependent and a columns dependent. So we'll talk about that in the example. We'll, we'll actually talk about the use of directional measures depending on uh, how you assign the, the de dependent and the independent, the, the X and the Y, if the Y is in the columns or the Y is in the rows. And then we have measures for ordinal categories. For ordinal categories, we have concordant minus discordant, which is a test. And we also have the Spearman rank correlation. These are tests of hypotheses. And then we also then have the measures of association. So in measurement systems analysis, we have ordinal uh, measurement systems. We use Kendall's correlation. That's the same thing as what we have here, Kendall's tau b. Okay, so if you have a square table, you want to use Kendall's tau b. If you have a rectangular table, you want to use Kendall tau, Stewart tau c. So as I said at the outset, there's a lot of measures here, but usually, they're all going to tell the same story. You're, probably, you're not going to see one measure largely different from the others, but it gives you a lot of flexibility to choose which met metrics you wish to apply. And then Sommers D are the ordinal association that, that have rows dependent or columns dependent. All right, so let's look at some examples here. I'm going to start with attribute data. We have three suppliers, A, B, and C, and we have a pass-fail marginal. And this is in the workbook, and we want to see if there is a significant relationship between supplier and pass-fail marginal. And we're going to run this now with the nominal categories. So immediately we see what that, I should point out that it is significant, and we do have, we can, by looking at the highlighted adjusted residuals, we can tell that supplier A uh, failure, if you compare failures, are significantly lower than expected. Supplier B marginal are significantly higher than expected. If we compare supplier B actual marginals to expect to the expected. Supplier C, the Looking at marginals, again, the marginals are significantly lower than expected. So that's what the uh, adjusted residuals help you, and you just look at the difference between the observed uh, and the expected. And now the degree of association, 
we, and I'm, I'm going to skip, there's a lot of different things here, but the Kramer's V is the most common, and so we have this 0 0.1, which is a weak association. So it's significant, but it's weak. All right? We, we, we have these other chi-square tests. I'll skip those. The main point of interest is, is that not only now can you test whether or not there's a significant difference, but to what extent or to what degree is the association between the categories. Now, finally, the ordinal association, we have a salary example. So if I pull that up, we have data that shows salary survey based on salary dollars in, in groups and then level of satisfaction. And we want to know whether or not there is an association between salary and job satisfaction. Now, when you just run the nominal, you see that the p-value is a fail to reject. So uh, if, it's, if you're just treating the categories as nominal, you would conclude that there was no association. However, when you switch to ordinal, all of a sudden you can see that, in fact, there is a, an association. And if we look here, all these associations are kind of hovering around the point two, the Spearman rank and the Kendall's tau. And so we would conclude that, yes, there is a significant association, but it's actually a weak association. Now, one of the things that we included in the workbook is showing you how to look at this data graphically. And we show you how to use Excel, the Excel 100% stack column chart. So it gives you a nice way of comparing satisfaction by salary, uh, and you can easily switch back and forth. So this is not Sigma Excel. This is pure Excel. In chi-square analysis, uh, you have what is known as a mosaic plot. The mosaic plot varies the width of the bar. However, this, this comes close in, t in terms of giving you a, a visual representation. We have another example, and I'll just wrap it up. And that example is loyalty versus satisfaction. And we converted the SAT scores to discrete. And when you run that, you can see that not only is it significant, but the association is strong using that 0.5 threshold. And so we, because, it, because the table is not square but rectangular, then tau C is appropriate. And also, because lo uh, loyalty is the dependent variable, and we put that in the rows, we would use the rows dependent Somers D. So we can see here, these are all above 0.5. And that tells you that there's a strong association. And you can see that when you use Excel's 100% stack column chart, that this is SAT 0 is blue, so basically dissatisfied. The red is SAT1, that's greater than 3.5, so these are the satisfied. So you can see the nice relationship between loyalty and SAT scores when you use that graphical tool. And that concludes our webinar covering multiple comparisons and the uh, chi-square tests. Uh, the, the, by the way, these are the references, various references uh, to uh, the new features that we talked about today. And then uh, th this is where the rules of thumb come from, the Cohen book, Statistical Power Analysis. And I also want to mention DEPA. This is a really nice presentation. It's actually part of a course that's online, a biostatistics course. But he does a really good job of covering the uh, measures of associate, the table measures of association, both ordinal and nominal, as well this paper by Gingrich, or article by Gingrich, two useful references for further information on table associations. So we will call that a wrap. And I want to thank you all very much for your participation. Thank you very much.